I put on an album, What's Your Superpower, about a month ago, and I am going to be giving you guys a breakdown of the title track, What's Your Superpower, in Ableton. Basically, the process it went through and how I made it. For those of you who have been in the community, I started working on the project mid-December, and it was going to be a lo-fi project. I started working on it, and it just was not my vibe. I just wasn't feeling it. I have a bunch of lo-fi beats that I made around the beginning of the pandemic, and one of them was the original version of What's Your Superpower. It definitely had some good tracks, but because I am the producer I am, I can't really put out a lo-fi album. It's just not my vibe. It wasn't what I was feeling. So this is it. Life is literally a video game. Now, y'all heard me say this plenty of times. It was real grimy sounding, kind of boom bap, like dark. That's the original. Hold this in your mind. This is the new version. This is the version that made it to the album. So the difference is there are vocal samples in it, there are horns in it, fuller keys and chord progression. The drums sound cleaner and slap harder. It's wider sounding, it's brighter. So I wanna show you guys, some of you who are OGs on the stream have seen me while I was working on the track in the very beginning. The original session was, you know, more of a lo-fi vibe. This one I tried to make bigger, just better sounding. So I'm going to show you guys the session in Ableton and basically how I got it to that level. In this session, there are 112 tracks and I deleted all the stuff that is not used in this. So let's start with the drums. The kick drum is Tame Kick from Drums at Knock Volume 8. I think the clap I use from another kit that is not Drums at Knock. The hi-hat is the autosave drum loop from Drums That Knock Volume 9. Much cleaner sounding than the original as you hear. So these are the different parts of the melody. There's this, which is the same loop I used from the original version. Pad. And a drone, drone bass. All of these keys were played by A.O. Nick. Shout out to A.O. Nick. He killed it on the keys on a bunch of tracks on the project. So on that drone, I just cut some of the low end and I side chained it to the kick. Same thing with the pad. I cut the low end. With this part of the melody, I didn't do anything to it. But, on the group, I added Sketch Cassette. Just to give it a little more grit. So I added Sketch Cassette to everything Ayo Nick sent me. So, this is with Sketch Cassette, and this is without it. Without it. With it. Very subtle, it just added a little bit of mid-frequency, a little bit of dirt, which I thought sounded good. Nao Nick played that with the whole track. Just little ear candy, it's all about the ear candy, it's all about adding little things that add a little bit to the track. Again, Ayo Nick added this whistle kind of sound, so with the track. I like that whistle, it kind of gave it a West Coast vibe, but a little bit of like an eerie, dark, midnight kind of vibe. This track, when I hear it, it reminds me of cruising at midnight, just on the freeway, or you're on the side streets and there's no cars around. It's all dark, it's just street lights, it's just you and the road. I'm a night owl, so that resonates with me. He played it a bunch more times, but I kind of scaled it back and just put it in where I felt necessary. And I played some instruments from Spitfire Lab, some horns and stuff like that. Okay, so a piano. Just like a little piano thing. Just adds a little bit of color to it. Just little things here and there.
some horns I played on Spitfire Labs with the track. And Kyla's horns in the background, but we'll get to that. We have two horn players on this track. Kyla, Seb Zillner, and me on the synth horns. So this is how the track starts out. And it keeps playing throughout. I feel like this Rhodes, these particular jazzy chords, kind of gave me like this reminiscent Tribe Called Quest feel. I'm a fan of Tribe Called Quest, J Dilla. I added some gritty effect to it. I use this plugin by Wave Tracing called SP950. It emulates Emu SP12 or SP1200 and an Akai S950. I'm going to show you guys when I turn it down what happens. It's the same effect that was made popular on records by like Pete Rock, Marley Marl. They reminisce over you, for example, by Pete Rock. The reason why that record had such a warm grit to it is because back in, you know, the early 90s, when they would sample, they used to use this piece of gear called the SP-1200 made by Emu. So what would happen is they would get a record, right, with the sample on it. Because what they did was they sampled off records, off vinyl. They'd collect vinyl, sample it. They put it on the turntable, and because the SP-1200 only had like 12 seconds of sampling time or less, what they had to do was take the record and speed it up. So instead of playing a 33 RPM record on 33, they'd play it on 45. Or they'd play it by hand, by just spinning it with their hand. So what that did was it allowed them to sample more of the sound into less time. So if you had 12 seconds of sample time and you had like a 16 second loop or something like that, you just spun it really quickly or put it on 45. Then what they would do once it was in the sampler is they would manually slow it down by pitch shifting it like we do in Ableton by using the pitch knob. They would use the pitch slider on the SP-1200. And that was like a cheat code for back then. That's how they outsmarted the samplers. What they would do is do that for the effect also, it gave it like this gritty, warm effect that was synonymous with hip hop. So it's the difference between a clean loop like this. And this is like with the sound that you got from the SP. Here it's got that like ring modulated kind of gritty feel to it. That's why I did that. And that sound was super sought after and it's not something you get in a DAW when you pitch shift and all that. A plugin like SP950 or even you can do it for free with the Erosion plugin in Ableton. That's another way you could do it. And then there's this sound. Just gives it a bounce, a melodic bounce. And then with everything. It's subtle in the background, but it's there. And then I use this plugin by XLN Audio. It's called Addictive Drums 2. It's a dope plugin if you want some quick live sounding drums. And I added Crash in it. And then I added a little live hi-hat track to it. Quiet, but it's in there. It's just in the cut on top of my hi-hat from Drums and Knock Volume 9. And so this section, I actually played this on a live stream that I was on, on Twitch. Some of you guys got to see this. I just added a bunch of little percussion sounds to the track just to give it that fullness. So I'm going to show you the track without it and then with it. So this is a track without all that stuff. Ready? I'm going to turn it on in one, two, three. See how that just gives it space and just kind of like it adds to the warmth and texture of the track. So this is what I added. I basically took little percussion in my studio and just recorded it. This is one of the tracks. It's very, very gentle. I don't even know what I did. I probably just moved around some percussion. And you see I hard panned this left. Hard pan this right. This one is this. 
Just this, I went very gentle with it. So all these types of loops are in all my drums and knock kits. I have a lot in drums and knock one through nine have those kind of loops. Just a wood block. I use pancake to auto pan just this wooden sound. All of this stuff combined, it just adds warmth and depth and texture to the track. I just added EQ, I cut some of the lows, glue compression, and some side chain compression with the regular compressor. Added some more EQ on this. I added some sketch cassette, some imager with Isotope Ozone. Dope plugin, allows you to add width to your sounds. I use this plugin a lot. It's Ableton stock plugin called Gate. What it does is it just gates the sound. So if you have a noise floor, you can turn this on just to make it silent. That's probably because I was getting feedback from my headphones or from the room. So let's hear it without it. You know, there's some low level noise in it. With it, it just cuts the noise. I use this plugin called Pancake 2. It's a free plugin by Cable Guys. It does basically the same thing as Auto Pan. I just like it a little better, so I use this instead of Auto Pan. But Auto Pan does pretty much the same thing. This is a sample I just grabbed off a of splice. Just a little vocal sample. And Auto Pan that one too. Very subtle. Another little vocal sample. <laughs> this is an ASMR sample I grabbed off a of splice. A little more texture. Shout out to Seb Zillner. Seb Zillner is a super dope horn player. He added a bunch of dope horns to the track too. So this is what he sent me. So that's all played by Seb Zillner, and with the track... I mixed it in the track so it's real subtle, but you feel it. So on top of Ayo Nick's kind of Tribe Called Quest style playing, I added Seb Zillner's horns, which just gives it more richness. I like to add synthesized elements mixed with realistic elements. It just adds to it. So I'll play you the individual parts that Seb Zillner sent over to. Flute. So fire. Second flute, third flute. Sax. Another sax. And on top of that, he added this little ear candy that I sprinkled throughout the track, just to give it more dimension. Gives it this old school kind of reminiscent vibe. This whole track has this nostalgic vibe to it. And I feel like these horns and the flute and everything just adds to the nostalgia. The way I processed it, again, I use this plugin that I was talking about a minute ago. It's that SP1200 effect, SP950, and turned it down so it gives it grit. So this is without it. Super clean and with it. Hear the difference? It's right from a Pete Rock record, straight up. And then I added just the Ableton stock delay. Then I added some vocal chops from Arcade. Just gives it a little more vibe. And then Kyla was a last minute addition to the record because she was chilling with Torin and she added some horns to the track. Now, I already had sax from Seb Zillner, but when Kyla adds horns, you gotta add Kyla horns because She's fire. So this is what Kyla added. I chopped it up. Just crazy dopeness.
So when I play it with the track, you'll hear it's like ear candy, just little things to keep the listener interested. And I always tell everyone when I give beat feedback, make sure you add enough ear candy. You want to add things into your track that just keep the listener engaged. Because if you just have a loop, it's boring. I think just little things can really bring out your track. So this is what it sounds like with the rest of the track. And then Seb Zillner's horn right there. So I used two horn players on the track. I got Seb Zillner, Kyla, and Ayo Nick on the keys. To make greatness, sometimes it doesn't mean you have to sit in front of your computer and do everything yourself. It's okay to work with other people who can help elevate your track to the next level. Can I play horns? No. Am I a keyboard player? No. I can play, but Ayo Nick is at a different level than me. He can play better chords and, you know, get more jazzy with it. Sometimes to add different musicians adds different spice to it. Now, the way I came up when I first started producing, I used to sample off vinyl. So now I don't sample off vinyl anymore. I sample other musicians. Kyla sent me some crazy horns. So I would cut the pieces that I felt made the track, took it to the next level. And I'm cutting from a musician that is now a writer on the track. So now Kyla gets a percentage on the track. Ayo Nick gets a percentage on the track. Seb Zillner gets a percentage on the track. I get a percentage on the track. It's a collaborative effort. It's not just sampling and waiting to get sued. And then here's another layered horn section from Kyla. And with the track. Very subtle, I kept it low in the background so you hear it if you're zoned in with headphones. But if you weren't, you might've missed it. So here's some more horns. And then with the track. Very subtle, but it does things. And then this. And then with the track. Okay, and then the outro of the track. So like the main part of the outro is this. All the percussion I played live. So these are little hand percussions that I found around my studio and just layered them together to give it this rich feeling. And again, all these types of loops are on Drums at Knock, volume one through nine. All the kits, basically. So that just gives it a richness and a texture and just this fullness. And I added just a bunch of little effects. I took this sample, which is just basically... You're unlocking more superpowers. I just sampled this thing off of YouTube with this dude saying, you're unlocking more superpowers. So in this section... You're unlocking more superpowers. And then I added just a little whisper. You're unlocking more superpowers. The knock shout, infamous vocal tag. And then just little ear candy. Just all from Drums and Knock Volume 9. Tabla sounds. Pad sounds, blasted effect sounds, all kinds of little things. That is the whole session. That's how I made Whatcha Superpower. It's 112 tracks, y'all. It was a lot of work, but I feel like it was all worth it. That's why I made this the title track and the intro to the project. I just feel like it captures this nostalgia. Then I'll talk about the master. I'll show you guys what I did with the master. There's a lot on this master. So some of you ask me, you know, how do I get my to slap on the master? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna group this and we're gonna turn it off. I'm gonna show you what it sounds like with no master and then how I mastered the track. Oh my God. So that's with no master. And then with the master. Completely transformed. Wow, I did a lot on that one. Okay, so here's what I did. The first plugin's a utility. I just lowered the volume going in a little bit. 
The second plugin is FabFilter Pro Q3. I have it in linear phase mode. I cut some of the low end, cut a lot of mids, like four decibels of mids here, and it's a wide cut. The reason I did that was because the track sounded really muddy. Instead of addressing it in the stem level, which normally I would do, in this case it was originally a lo-fi beat, so I addressed it at the master level. So I did a wide cut at like four decibels and then like a very small boost at about eight kilohertz. The next plugin, this is like a cheat code plugin. I put this on pretty much all my masters. I just use Gulf Foss and I set the recover to 24 and the tame to 23%. After Gulf Foss in the chain, I have this plugin multiband dynamics. I talked about this in my last stream. I'm hardly doing anything to this at all. This first one, I'm actually doing stuff. I did some light compression on all three bands, a little heavier compression on the high frequencies and the mid frequencies and the low frequencies have very, very little compression. Let me group this section. Okay, so, so far we're sounding like this. And then with this. So you can hear right now without this first multiband, it sounds a little dull. That kind of like evened it out a little bit. And you can see I have the dry wet set to 53. So I'm compressing the three frequency bands and then I'm adding a little bit of gain to the high frequencies and the mid frequencies. Next in the chain, I have another multiband compressor. And if you look at this, I'm not doing any compression with it. I talked about it on the stream and then posted it on YouTube and showed this trick where you take a multiband dynamics plugin, do nothing to the compression, and then add just some gain on the output. And a lot of people said, and I didn't even realize this, the sound that you're getting, the difference in sound is actually phase, which typically from a production standpoint is a bad thing. So it's like a no-no in the production world. You don't want to use phase necessarily as an effect. Well, I found that in the instance of multiband dynamics, when you put it on a master or something, sometimes that phase, which is a bad thing, sounds good. I found that if you just take a multiband plugin and do nothing to it and add it to your master, it tames that in a pleasing way. I'll let you guys be the judge. A lot of like OG engineers might be like, yo, that's a bad technique, don't do it. But I'm not that, I'm a creative, I'm a creator. I just make what sounds good to me and I'm not always by the books. I just like to have fun with music and try things that break new ground. This is what it sounds like without it. And then with it. What it does to my ears. Okay, you might call it phase. It sounds like hitting tape. <laughs> Honest to God, that pleasing sound when you hit tape, it rounds off some of the transients in a pleasing way. So if the kick is poking out of the mix a little too much, when you add this plugin, it rounds it out. I recommend you be the judge. You grab a multiband dynamics plugin, put it on your master with nothing on it and see what it does. Sometimes it does not work. If you want your transients to be really punchy, you might not want to do this trick. But if your kick and snare are just poking out of the mix too much, grab one of these plugins, do nothing to it, and put it on your master. In this case, I added some high frequency and low frequency. But it works really well with nothing too. So this is where we're at so far. And then with all the other games. The next plugin I added is an Ableton stock saturator. Without it, And then with it. Without it. With it. As I've said, every breakdown on the master and when you're doing anything to your tracks in general, at least this is how I work. A rule of thumb for me is a little bit of effects with every plugin. Don't do too much with one plugin. It's cumulative effects over different plugins. I like to barely do anything because it's not making the plugin work too hard and you're not getting too much character from each plugin. It's a cumulative character after all of them. So with this, I'm actually doing a negative drive with the soft sign. The reason being is because it's hidden it very lightly. I turn up the bass and I turn down the dry wet. 
And what it's doing is it's kind of compressing the sound with saturation ceiling. It's doing very little saturation, but I find that it just adds a little bit of warmth to the sound. The next plugin is stock Ableton glue compressor. Most of this masters stock. So without it, with it, without it, with it. So what this plugin is doing is also evening out the transients again. So I have negative 7.6 gain reduction and then five decibels of makeup gain. So what's happening if you look at the gain reduction meter, I'm doing like one decibel of gain reduction. So it's catching the peaks of the kick and the snare. I added a saturator before the glue because you're getting that crunchy little bit of distortion from the saturator and a little compression. And then the glue compressor keeps that character, but crunches it down a little more. So you're having a more even, less dynamic range sound, which is what I was going for with this track. I wanted to be punchy, but not too punchy, not too dynamic. So that's why a little bit of compression can go a long way. And then I did gain boost with no soft clipping. So there's no soft clipping either on the saturator or the compressor. But if you look at the master, we're hardly clipping at all. In terms of Ableton, I'm not concerned with clipping because we're working in 32-bit anyways. As long as we're going into the plugins at a reasonable level, I'm cool with that. Some people might say it's better to gain stage at negative six. That's fine, but with stock Ableton plugins, I don't find that I need to. To each his own, whatever works for you. So this is where we're at so far. And that's where we're going. Very, very subtle. You have to really listen in headphones to hear that. But the next plugin, this is a dope clipping plugin. It's Newfangled Audio Saturate. What I like about it is it just lets you add a little more of the detail. It has like a little bit of clipping, a little bit of limiting. This is good if you want a gentle effect. To be honest, you could probably get the same effect with glue compressor if it's just very minor clipping, but I like to use this because it gives you a little more control. So newfangled audio saturate, hit the drive, three decibels, a little bit of detail preservation, which is limiting, and soft clipping. The next plugin, I put another Fab Filter Pro Q3 in linear phase mode and cut the low frequency below 30 hertz. Again, to clean up the low end, because you don't really need that information below 30, depending on what you're producing. But for this type of music, we don't need that low, 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 low sub frequency. So I cut that. And the last plugin that I use in the chain is FabFilter Pro L2. I've talked about this for the other tracks, and I'm gonna tell you the reason I use this plugin. Because you can see it's not doing anything from a limiting perspective, it's not doing anything. Hardly anything, very little. I set it to true peak limiting. What that's doing is it's catching the true peak. It's limiting the true peaks. And the reason that's important is from a streaming perspective, because I distribute this music to Spotify, Apple Music, everything. By catching the true peaks, Spotify will do less penalty on the mixes. I'm oversampling eight times just for the quality. I'm surprised my computer can handle a 100 track session with 8x oversampling. I use this plugin to dither. Sometimes I use Good Dither by Good Hertz, but in the case of this album, I used Pro L2 to dither. So I'm dithering from 32 bit to 24 bit because streaming services cannot handle 32 bit audio. So instead of having the streaming services dither it, I decided to dither because then it's compatible with these services. And the last step, this is something I've talked about before, super important if you are uploading to streaming. If you decide that you want to submit a mix that has loudness above negative 14 LUFS for like Spotify, it's like negative 13 for Apple. What Spotify recommends is that you set your true peak limiting to negative two decibels. In this case, at the master level, I'm making sure I cut it at negative two decibels. 
So then when you upload it, the explanation they give is if they have to convert to a different format, for example, from WAVE to MP3 or OGG, you won't have any clipping above zero decibels when the conversion happens. So that's why negative two decibels true peak is important. That's from Spotify themselves. You can read about it. I think it's on their website. I just do that as a safety because I don't want my tracks to get penalized any more than they already are because they're already way louder than negative 14. Let's see what this one's at. Yeah, so I have it set to short term, but as you can see, it's like negative 11, negative 10. And if we go to other parts in the song, it's going to go to like negative 9. You get the idea. It's short term, so it's not getting integrated. You can choose to do that. But I do short term so I can see what that section is hitting at. That's pretty much it. That is how I made What's Your Superpower. That's some of my mindset and what artists I brought on board in the executive production of it, how I mixed it, how I mastered it, how it all came together.